not yet not yes we are live we are live in the next broadcast this one is not pre-recorded this one is live so everybody who's live here say hi to here who is here Lichens, who is a, a renowned professor and uh, all that jazz with many publications from the Radboud University uh, Medical Center Computational Pathology Group. Heard, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, but just to remind uh, everyone who is with us, uh, there will be certificates if you want certificates. So send us a DM on LinkedIn. Second of all, LinkedIn has been funny with us. So if you have any troubles uh, hearing us on LinkedIn, you probably don't hear that. But <laughs> YouTube should work and Facebook works. And uh, another thing, yeah, if this is valuable, go ahead, subscribe to the channel. And this is, uh, I'm super happy to see you coming to this broadcast. So say hi to Herd. Herd, tell us about yourself. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, Alexandra. Um, yeah, so I work at the Rabat University Medical Center as assistant professor in computational pathology right now. And, uh, well, uh, I traditionally uh, am an engineer by training, uh, biomedical engineering, and uh, started in radiology, but decided that the pink and purple, blue it's, images are pretty, much more, right? yes, much prettier than uh, these uh, old-fashioned uh, grayscale radiology images, so made the switch. Uh, now we're working a lot in the space of uh, prostate cancer uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think today we're going to talk a bit about uh, unsupervised learning. Yes, definitely. This is the topic of our broadcast. And um, I already had Herod as a guest in one of my podcasts, one of my video podcasts, where he talked about weekly supervised learning. And I ambitiously thought in that podcast, uh, we can cover also uh, the unsupervised. Didn't happen. We needed a separate broadcast for that. So this is our topic for today. And the first question is, what is unsupervised deep learning? How this relates to the supervised and the weekly supervised? What is it, Gerd? Yeah, so um, in those three categories, I think most people are familiar with supervised learning. So in mm -hmm. supervised learning, you have, for example, images and associated labels that describe what is on this image. So pictures from cats and dogs, and then you have for each image a label that says whether there's a cat or a dog. Or you um, can have a label urothelial carcinoma. Exactly. So that is a label for that uh, that whole slide image. Uh, and then, for example, you can have also labels for individual objects within that image. So uh, stromal tissue, nuclei, uh, now, as we're seeing here right now. So these are all uh, nuclei. There's some other stuff in between. Uh, and if you have like a label for every object, that's typically considered supervised learning. Whereas if you have a label for uh, a group of objects, uh, then typically we call it uh, weekly supervised learning. And an example can be um, that you have uh, slides of uh, prostate biopsies, for example, where some prostate biopsies have uh, prostate cancer, but some prostate biopsies will not have prostate cancer. And you only know that which slide has which, but you don't know where in the slide, uh, for example, the prostate cancer is. Mm -hmm. uh, in a fully supervised setting, you would know where it is. In a weekly supervised setting, you only know that it is in the slide, but not where. There. In an unsupervised setting, you just have a set of prostate biopsies and you don't know anything. You don't know in which one there is cancer. You don't, you just know a broad category. And what makes unsupervised learning interesting is that actually it's the way that we as humans do most of our learning. For example, if you take a baby or a small child and uh, you show him, a, let's say, uh, different types of apples and you don't say it's an apple, but they will learn to recognize the shape and the object. And if you then show them a banana, they will be able to tell you that that doesn't belong without knowing what the actual objects are. Um, and for example, in this pathology, this can be attractive because data without labels is typically very easy to get. You just empty like a whole, whole cover, covered with uh, slides and you have millions upon millions of samples. The mm -hmm. tricky part is getting the labels. That's typically expensive, time consuming, requires specific expertise. So that's why it, that's not just for histopathology, but for imaging in general, uh, unsupervised learning 
has increased in popularity because of, of this aspect, that it's very easy to collect unlabeled data. Uh, you've seen that with these fancy new models that can generate beautiful images based on text. These are mainly yes. using unsupervised <laughs> learning. Um, I got into that discussion with Dan and he was trying to explain to me exactly how it's happening that it can generate from text. I got a little bit confused. I can imagine. Yeah, it's it's uh, pretty complicated and that the, the, those developments are really like at the state of the art where we are now, right now with AI. Uh, so yeah, you get into very complicated models, uh, it, models that are interconnected. So you have a language model and an image model. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, yeah, and so you... It can get quite, quite confusing, I can imagine. Uh -huh. Maybe at the end of this broadcast, I'm going to circle back to this question. I need a little bit uh, shout out for my people uh, in the audience. Say hi to Herd. I only saw two highs for Herd. Are you like, do you want us to talk about it? If you do want us to talk about it, let us know. Show us some love, uh, show us some likes, uh, some comments there. Uh, and obviously, we're just starting, so the questions will start coming later. But show me that you're there. I see that some people are there. Uh, show this uh, in the comments so that I can show that we have people from Liverpool. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Show us that you're there. Now. Uh, so we know that unsupervised is getting more popular because you don't need to do extra work. You already have uh, stuff that is being done. And we know how annoying the labeling is for pathologists uh, and not only you know, whoever. Like if you uh, suddenly get tasked with labeling something that's not really part of your workflow, uh, obviously you want to gravitate towards methods that are less labor intensive. So what are the, it, this is one of the advantages. What are the advantages does this unsupervised learning have and what disadvantages? Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, I think the, the main advantages is that you generally don't have to, uh, so there are a couple of different uh, use cases you can use unsupervised learning for. And one is a simple data discovery. So, for example, if you have data where you don't know what the interesting features are, what the interesting aspects are to look at, in principle, with unsupervised learning, it should help you group similarly looking or similar categories in, well, similar objects into the same categories. And then you can visualize those, look at those categories. So it's sort of it can be a tool for data discovery. So if you don't get even know what labels you would be interested in. It's a way to identify, okay, these might be interesting categories to look at mm -hmm. later. Uh, so that's a popular use case. I think- uh, Do you have an people... example, like a tangible example that you worked with that it actually like showed you some group that you were not visually able to distinguish or like think of this label your own, on your own? Yeah, so it's uh, it, we used it in a project that was sort of a combination of weekly supervised and unsupervised learning. So what we did was we trained a, a model that could predict patient survival from prostate cancer directly from the H&E slides. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing was, once you have such a model, it will tell you, okay, this patient will die in two years, but it will not tell you what it was looking at to come to that decision. And that's what you as a pathologist probably would want to know, right? So what are the aspects in the image that are interesting? So what we did is we simply took the features <laughs> from that model. And then we uh, used a clustering strategy, which is an unsupervised learning method. So you don't put in any labels, you only put in the features that were learned, and then ask it to make a separation between coherent groups of well, we call it concepts, so visual concepts, so different sorts of growth patterns, essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we could explore those growth patterns and check whether which ones were more common in patients that uh, had recurrence and patients that did not get a recurrence of their prostate cancer. So, for example, what was very nice is that we could see that, uh, as we know from literature, that pre preformed growth patterns were more associated with uh, patients which had recurrence and patients which didn't have recurrence. The same with uh, growth patterns that look like introductal carcinoma in, in prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question was... here, 
a question here. You're saying that you kind of showed with your unsupervised method what was already uh, known from the literature. So you kind of confirmed that, okay, the method is doing something reasonable, uh, mm -hmm. but we already saw it. It was visually visible, so to say, and you kind of confirmed. How do you deal with, like, when there is nothing that you can... Uh, and we have a question, I think, um, uh, related to that. It is unsupervised when labeling, but when we have an output, it is always good to QC. I can imagine QC, the output is less time consuming than labeling. Can you elaborate on that? Okay, that's a little bit uh, in, in, like it's um, associated with what I wanted to uh, ask and we can um, do that uh, in a second, but like, okay, you do this unsupervised, you want to discover something. How do you know that you did not discover like, meaningless stuff that you did not discover yeah. junk because you can group those data in like million different ways right of course uh, yeah yeah so that's that. that's that's indeed so when you do for example a clustering approach like i described you in the end typically want to know some form of labels so what you then do is you inspect that's i think what the question abraham is asking with this question you look at the output of what your unsupervised system has come up with and you try to see if it visually makes sense to you mm -hmm. and that obviously is only possible if you can make visual sense of it so the experiment we did with the pathologist of course you can use your uh, vocabulary that you have learned during your training to describe what you are what you are seeing mm -hmm. right so even if it's um stuff you have not seen before you know you have words you have language that you can use to provide descriptions for what you are seeing. And maybe you discover a new pattern that was not described before. Uh, so for example, when I was working in prostate MRI, that was still relatively novel. And then at a certain point, the radiologists figured out that they were looking for what they called an erased charcoal sign. And that referred to like a, a look in the image where it looked like there was somebody made like a charcoal drawing of something and then smudged it out with it. his hand. And that was then a new descriptor and that's now like in guidelines what people should should look for so maybe we can also use unsupervised learning to discover these novel growth patterns uh in well, different uh, diagnostic questions and then later we have like a very creative description of how that looks i think in that sense but you pathology... have to see it we're still like okay even if it's not in the report you don't you're not used to describing it you still have to see it is that like obviously it's an image but what i want to ask is like what is the limitation of you seeing stuff there um like what do you do with something that you don't see and what could that even be like for example i don't know the special relationship of things that are very subtle you will not see it you will not be able to verify it visually uh, can you measure it like how do you translate it how do you make sense yeah. of it yeah, that can be quite complicated in the sense that uh, if it's like sub visual patterns or things that we as humans cannot visually discriminate, then it becomes very complicated in terms of wh what does it what does it really mean? So obviously there is then some discriminatory power or something that a machine can use to separate two categories, but mm -hmm. we as humans uh, cannot. Uh, you can see it a bit like if you have uh, sounds above uh, 20 uh, kilohertz or 20,000 kilohertz, we cannot hear them, uh, but they are there and there are animals that can differentiate between them. Uh, yeah, there is not a lot you can do. And that's one of the disadvantages of, of unsupervised learning. If you, you cannot always uh, assess what the machine is doing if that makes sense. Often you can mm -hmm. see it if you can see it if it doesn't make sense, right? So if it's like making separations in categories that you can visually assess are are meaningless mm -hmm. or not mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, but yeah, sometimes you get results where you as a human cannot see the difference, and it could be something as simple as okay, in this set the nuclei are on average five percent bigger than in that set. But yeah, how do yeah, you visually, visually it, assess? that mm -hmm. uh, and that's yeah that's something that machines can do very well and we might might struggle with mm -hmm. 
Okay, so yeah, that's obviously a disadvantage. But if you want to do discovery, then you, I guess you keep asking yourself these questions. Okay, there is something that looks like a data separation that looks very, very clean. Uh, is there something? What is it? How to dig deeper into this? Um, and so what are the current methods that are being used for unsupervised? So first, before we dive into the methods, um, we know that on the acceptance scale, the unsupervised is pretty low compared to uh, strictly supervised. And then obviously um, weekly supervised is in the middle because if we don't understand what we're doing, especially in the pathology community, um, like you, you tend not to trust it. But on the interest uh, to like decrease the workload and like push amounts of data through some pipeline and get insights, this is super high on the interest uh, scale. Um, how close are you to having anything that can be implemented? I assume there are publications. Where do we stand in the science and how close is the science to practice with unsupervised learning? Yeah, I think that's a, a, another use case of, of <clears throat> unsupervised learning that I think is especially attractive to, to pathology, uh, well, maybe medical imaging in general, is that you could use it for anomaly detection. Um, yes, let's talk about that. Yeah, so there the idea is that if you have a machine that you, uh, you in an unsupervised fashion learn to understand what uh normal tissue looks like for example so that's a bit like the example that i gave with the baby so if you just showed it a lot of different types of apple they will be able to say when something is not an apple without actually knowing what the other object is it could be a mm -hmm. banana it could be a motorcycle they will just know it's not an apple because they've seen a lot of apples um you could do the same trick with uh with unsupervised deep learning so you could uh, just grab an entire set of uh, normal slides of, for example, uh, kidneys of whatever, and then uh, turn an unsupervised method on that, um, which has to learn structure in the data. And then if it finds stuff that's not coherent with that structure that it has identified, it will be able to tell you that, okay, this is something that I don't know or I've never seen. And that can be very attractive because theoretically it could be used to, for example, uh, identify a disease if it has only seen normal uh, tissue before or identify a toxicological effect. Uh, Which in is slide. super interesting for me. So in toxicologic pathology and tox safety assessment, the slides that we looked at, I'm a toxicologic pathologist, uh, like you can have thousands of slides that are normal and you can still have to go you have to go through them and just watch thousands of slides that are normal. <laughs> and this is like the holy grail for us to find this anomaly detector that flags us the stuff that is, uh, is, is not normal. And we don't care what that is because we're trained enough to, when you show us the one slide that has that, to figure it out. Uh, how, do you know applications of this or where, where is it already being used or close to being used and how um, this where is so the application and second how distinct has the normal be from the abnormal for this to work uh, i'm asking that because our lesions in um, well in the whole world of pathology sometimes you have very subtle lesions and uh, even though they're very subtle the diagnosis uh, difference is huge and the, um, you know your projection for the toxicity of the drug or uh, for uh, the prognosis or for what's going to happen with the patient differs drastically even though the differences in the image are subtle yeah. does this still hold up how yeah, like, what's so... our limitation there yeah, so what you see right now in the in the field is that uh, the performance of these unsupervised method is really rapidly improving, uh, but specifically for histopathology, pathology, um, what you see is that in cases where it's generally pretty clear what the anomaly is. So we have, for example, done experiments for uh, identification of uh, metastases and lymph nodes, and it's very easy to just collect large sets of normal lymph nodes where 
nothing is going on. So we train an unsupervised method on that and then mm -hmm. try to use it to identify where the metastases were present and then the metastases were the anomaly. But obviously metastases generally don't look anything like regular lymph node tissue. And in those cases, it works really well. And it's even getting close to competitive with fully supervised learning where you need to annotate all these. So you did, so this is super cool because and this like is a theme throughout the lectures because you guys organize the chameleon challenge and you have the data set. So obviously you can compare benchmark different methods against this data set. So you're saying that the unsupervised anomaly detection was very similar in performance. How similar? Like, would you be comfortable replacing and just using the unsupervised on this or? Not yet, but I think we're quickly getting there. So maybe in a year or two, I think that the, my answer would be yes. Uh, right now, like uh, to just give you a ballpark number, if you use fully supervised methods, then you get areas under the curve. So well, rough accuracies of like 97, 98% uh, so in identifying slides which have metastases versus slides which do not. If you look at current state of the art with unsupervised methods, you're at like 92, 93, 94 ish so pretty good but not at the at the same level mm -hmm. and i right. think there the key is um, so if you want to get into how these methods work is what they try to do is they learn try to learn um how so trying to not get too technical but um, you can get technical if i don't understand that's fine i already okay. like was not so, understanding stuff and we have people that can comment that are like more advanced on the computer science side so whenever you have a question or you want me to ask a question put it in the chat and here it, go away uh, sorry <laughs> go away go ahead and uh, yeah. challenge me with the technical stuff yeah so uh, the, traditionally what was often done was uh, sort of uh, what was called auto encoders so for example yes, we had an, an image yeah. in an image is very high dimensional, could be like 265 pixels uh, square. And then it would go into uh, autoencoder, which was a neural network, which then goes from, for example, these 265 times 265 pixels to 128 features, and then back up to 265 times 265 pixels. And the idea would then be that this autoencoder had to be able to reproduce the original image uh, via a reduction of the feature space to 128 features. So that mm -hmm. meant that it had have to learn a representation of the image which could, could fit into 128 numbers. And this mm -hmm. feature vector typically is called a latent space. And if you have a model that's very good at reconstructing different categories of images, that means that this latent space has a good uh, matches well with the distribution of your normal data. And what you can very simply do is say, okay, if I then put in uh, a sample that might be an anomaly, uh, this feature space should, the, the feature vector should be very far away from all the, the others. So if you would consider it a, a 2D problem, so your, your latent space would be two dimensional, you could simply plot it and you would expect to have, a, if it would be, uh, within your distribution it would be very close so all these points would be very close together and then you would get an anomaly and this point would be very far, far uh, away. away in this plot and you can simply measure the distance uh, to assess whether it's an anomaly and that's uh, what was traditionally done but that worked okay but this uh, latent space that was learned generally was not very robust so if there was like a tiny shift in your normal distribution and pathology, you have this, right? Different scanners, different labs. Then suddenly every sample from another lab would be considered it's an anomaly. Going to be an anomaly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what we've seen over the past years is that these methods to learn this latent space have become more and more and more advanced. Uh, and then, then we get back to these uh, these language models can generate images. So the current state of the yeah, let's talk about that. I was so confused when Dan was explaining <laughs> this to me, but basically, yeah, you start, and I'm gonna insert little questions. Yeah. So uh, the image part of those models is called a diffusion model. So I think many people will from high school know the concept of diffusion, right? So if you, for example, uh, do a drop of coffee somewhere, then it will slowly diffuse across 
your table or if you um, put yeah, a drop right, like of uh, your coffee, like for part of it, this is going to be non-transparent anymore because it's going to. Yeah, and it will slowly diffuse throughout the water. I'm not going to um, do a demo because I want to drink my coffee. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, and the idea behind these diffusion models is that uh, if you uh, you can uh, bit compare it to if you have like a painting of a like a wet, of wet paint of an object and you would pour water on it and this paint would flood out and you would no longer recognize what is what was on the original painting right yeah a bit like this so you're so slowly your coffee is diffusing throughout your water and you don't at a certain point cannot see anymore if it was coffee or was coke or whatever it looks um, like coke right or something yeah and what you try to teach these models is to go back from what you have now to the coffee so to learn to reconstruct uh -huh. from this diffused image reconstruct the original okay so you like okay now my uh, part like how to translate it for people who don't understand meaning me so basically i only gave a little bit of coffee into my water but i want it back to the like full appearance of my coffee yeah so essentially what you want to learn the network is you added coffee to the water and now you tell the network okay you have to figure out how to get back to the original water so okay, you put so the, something so, in okay. the water so i put something that like clouds it but yeah. i want the water to be transparent again yeah so okay. the network has to learn how to remove that mm -hmm. uh, and in the in how we do that practically is we add noise to images and we add yes more and more and more noise until at a certain point you cannot recognize the original image anymore. And now we tell these models, okay, now figure out how to get back to the original. Mm -hmm. and I can understand that. But how does this apply to text and image, to words and image? Yeah, how so do the, you know that? Yeah, so th that's the image part. So once this model is trained, you can just give it uh, like an image completely filled with noise and it will mm -hmm. transform that into a, a realistic looking image it has learned how to do that the other part of this model is a language model and that is also trained in an unsupervised fashion mm -hmm. but that's actually conceptually very simple the way these models are trained is for example you take a, a poem from shakespeare or a book and you give the model uh, like the first sentence and tell it okay now you have to predict the next word and then the word after and uh -huh. then the word after so uh, you don't have to tell it whether it's, you just can train it on any text you have and it will learn how to essentially autocomplete text. So uh, if you do this with uh, Shakespeare poems, you will have Is a that Shakespeare. what we get in the phones, like this auto suggestions? Yeah, although those are still relatively stupid <laughs> versions uh -huh. of these algorithms. So the, the new ones are pretty sophisticated. Uh, so yeah, I think there, if you Google on the internet, for example, for GPT-3, you can get these nice uh, examples where if you type like a, one sentence of a story of like a fairy tale, it will complete the fairy tale for you. Uh -huh. So those are the, the two models. And now what they do is they condition the image model on the language generator. So that means that uh, you give it a sentence and this results in a feature vector from the language model and the image model has to generate something that's consistent with the feature vector from the language model. So if I write uh, 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 yeah, two, two, uh, two apples and an orange, then mm -hmm. this image generator is penalized if it doesn't generate something that's consistent with this description. Okay. So you're essentially, so essentially you have two unsupervised trained models and then you condition one on the other. Mm -hmm. And also do it the other way around. So you can also say, okay, I have uh, these two models and I want the, the language model to generate the description based on the image I have. So you can also then you get sort of an image captioning uh, method. Okay. Now, let's take it uh, the, to the next step and talk about how do you apply this in pathology. Do you see it? Like, do you already work in this? 
Um, Dan was mentioned that you do a little bit of unsupervised work with the reports, but uh, how would you see it in pathology? Or maybe it's already there and you just can tell me how it's being used. Yeah, so these diffusion models, so the, the image part of these models we are already using. Uh, so we have uh, running research in the group there. We use them for anomaly detection. Mm -hmm. So we essentially learn a model how to generate normal tissue. And then if we give it uh, abnormal tissue, it will not be able to reconstruct it. So then we just say it's an anomaly. Okay. So you did this on the lymph nodes. Did you do it on anything else? Yeah, so also trying it for uh, other purposes, but we don't have results on that yet. But for the lymph mm -hmm. nodes, it works very well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, like you said, it, the most interesting part are the most subtle anomalies. So for that, we still need to try it out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for the language model, we currently have a project where we indeed try to do this image captioning part. So we have, um, you can have a model that generates images or even a completely supervised model. And what you want is actually not just say, uh, like uh, the, the example I gave with predicting uh, whether a prostate cancer patient will survive or not, you also want the model to describe why it thinks that. So what we're trying to do is train these language models on pathology reports, and then actually have it generate a pathology report given an image so that the model actually has to describe like a pathologist, what it sees in the image using the same language that, that you are using. How does that work? Did you read a report like that? When you read it, does it make sense? Well, I've been working in pathology now for six years and I wouldn't claim that I understand every report I read, but I, I'm getting better. It's uh, okay. it's sort of, a, I would say, a special form of poetry. Yeah, I would like to see it, like how far it is from, but like, is it, does it make cohesive sentences and like, is it okay for you to read even like if you don't understand it? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's uh, actually uh, the the report generation itself is pretty uh, good. So um, you can let it co generate completely random reports, but then still the report in itself is coherent. It will not suddenly go from uh, this breast pathology and then later mention something about prostate. So the por uh, report mm -hmm. in itself is pretty coherent. Uh, you can also prime it. So that's what I mentioned with the autocomplete, right? So you can give it the first sentence, like... Uh, uh, okay, and like if you have a structure, you can give it the structure and that can fill in the blanks. Yeah, or, or for example. The... Yeah. So question, do you guys have a report like that that you could share with me? Like an uh, artificial that is de-identified or anything like that? Yeah, I think probably I will... I have to ask the student that is working on that whether he has something we can share. Uh, okay. But be happy to do so. If there was something you can share, would you guys uh, let me know in the comments? Would you want to like make? M would you want me to make a video about this? Uh, let me know. Uh, report video in the comments if you want me to talk about that. Uh, I think it might be fun. Uh, one question that I have uh, is. So at some point, I think 2019, there was this paper about um, context-based image retrieval, like mm -hmm. uh, searching for similar images in images. Uh, does this fit into the unsupervised category or supervised or somewhere in between? And are you guys um, working with this? Yes, partly. And I see uh, yes for the video about the, the report, so good. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's definitely related um, in the sense that most content-based image retrieval methods also need to learn this latent space or this representation of an image because that's what they search for. So they convert every image into this latent space and then they say, okay, now I have two images where they are close in this latent space, so this, this plot, then I can probably show that as like a similar image. Where it differs is that in training the content-based image retrieval, you typically um, know which which samples you would prefer it to show to you. So that's mm -hmm. some form of supervision. It's not like um, as strong a supervision as literally labeling uh, 
what it is, but for example, you know, um, if you have a, a, a breast slide or a mouse kidney, uh, you I know a priori that you probably don't want to see a monkey liver or something, right? Indeed. Uh, so so is... if you have enough information uh, that puts what you want to see in a certain category, the same organ category, the same species category, maybe the same change category. So yeah, it's, there's some supervision you can use in helping these systems uh, learn more relevant uh, features. But the basis is indeed the same. It's unsupervised learning in the sense that it has to learn a representation of the content that you want to uh, search for. Mm -hmm. And do you have projects that use that? Do you have this work in your group? Yeah, so not directly in our group. Um, we have uh, projects within Big Picture that are looking into this. Um, and uh, we have Speaking other... Speaking of Big Picture, mm -hmm. the, we have a, um, a podcast episode with Jeroen, who is um, also involved in Big Picture, uh, that talks exactly what this project is about. Uh, but yeah, what do you do there in big picture for um, this image retrieval? Yeah, so the idea in big picture, of course, is to collect over 3 million histopathology slides, uh, also 2 million tox path, 1 million clinical. And yeah, if, as soon as you have a million slides or 3 million slides, uh, and you want to look for slides that are relevant for your research project, <laughs> um, yeah, be just searching on like the metadata, like uh, the, the categories, right, might not be uh, enough. So you might actually want to say, okay, given this database of 3 million slides, I see something that's that's interesting here, or this type of visual anomaly is something I want to see if that's present in other of these 3 million slides. So the mm -hmm. idea for this content-based image retrieval within Big Picture is essentially to be sort of a visual search engine for the database. How far are you there? Are you? We haven't started yet, sadly. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Big Picture is a six-year project, and this uh, starts uh, from year two, which is uh, mm -hmm. next January. Uh, and the reason for this, if you want to do this, you need the data, or you need data. That is true. You have to collect the data first. To, to... Yeah. Uh, are you responsible for any part of Big Picture? I'm the work package leader for the AI work package. Okay, so that's going to be in your uh, in yeah, your I'm, uh, yard. I'm, I'm supervising that task, but I'm not. Uh, we are not the ones implementing it. Mm -hmm. So, question. So, because this seems to be like so such a cool tool, right? You could basically like Google Lens do a search or like send a screenshot. Basically, you're evaluating on digital slides and you send the screenshot to some database. You get stuff with reports, with data. It's basically like me taking a slide to a colleague who has a lot more uh, years of experience than me and asking, is this relevant? What is this? Um, how close, like, Rate the ex, your expectations of success for this part of big picture, <laughs> or yeah, like, so like think... realistically, what can we aim for? Can we really aim? Like, what level of granularity can we aim for? Yeah, it's good that you mentioned Google Lens because actually Google Health wrote a publication about this. I think uh, one year ago, maybe two years mm -hmm. by now, uh, and they already showed quite some some nice results, uh, mainly at the, like the more the course level, right? Like I mentioned with the metastases and lymph nodes, it, the metastases mm -hmm. really different. So if you have like very visually striking things, then this content is based image retrieval uh, already worked quite well. Um, and then some... I always think nice, but this I can like understand on my own. Ex exactly. So, uh, I don't, I think we still have quite some work to do to really do this for more subtle uh, findings, but there also, it's really improving quite fast. I think in the past two years, there have been three very big publications already exactly on this topic for histopathology. Um, yeah, and I think this, this will, this really benefits from these advances in, in unsupervised learning. So uh, I think this will improve even further. Mm -hmm. I think the... So the main main question at a certain point also becomes a more of an engineering question. So if you have three million, million slides, how do you make sure that you can search it quickly and 
uh, you cannot use so in, in language models these models tend to be extremely big so you also have to make sure that it's still feasible to run uh, 20,000 searches in uh, in an hour or so mm -hmm. so um the question is i forgot my question i will i will uh, remember the question but we can take a question from the audience for now and uh, the question is how much unsupervised learning uh, is helpful to bridge the gap between pathologist and machine to me it's like the biggest gap that you can have but uh maybe you can comment on that yeah i think the main uh, main example is one i already gave a bit is on this uh topic where i said okay we have a machine learning model that is able to predict survival or a genetic mutation directly from the h e morphology and then we can use unsupervised <laughs> learning to give it sort of an explainable uh aspect so we can mm -hmm. identify uh, groups of, well, let's say image patches that show a pattern that's more associated with recurrence than with non-recurrence or with the mutation versus without the mutation. And we can show these clusters, these groups of patches to pathologists. So it can help with making machine learning models uh, more explainable. Um, Steven, in, that, in that sense, I can think it can help bridge the gap a bit. Uh, uh, the method itself, yeah, it's it's still pretty. Uh, it, it's uh, the really advanced methods, like implementing it, the the technology behind it is still quite complicated. So in that sense, I don't help. It. I think it helps uh, bridge the gap. But in terms of the use cases, I think it could help, like ex adding extra explainability to methods that are already there. Mm -hmm and good fantastic i need to remember my I, I i just remembered my question so we were talking sorry for everyone on the line for me to having this brain freeze but we were talking about the, the images that uh we wanted to search but the granularity is ah yeah i know okay good so you said at the beginning we're like one year from getting there from uh, this uh, you said about the um, chameleon database and that the supervisor is 98 the unsupervised at 93 area under the curve uh, in one year we're going to get there what has to happen in this year uh, to get there one thing you already mentioned the engineering challenges but what else like you don't like what has to happen for us to get there um yeah, I don't think a lot. I think we're already so close. It's mainly identifying uh, what the, the, it's a bit like, um, let's explain it like this. So when we first started with supervised learning with deep convolutional neural networks in 2012, we made a jump from uh, like error rate 25% to error rate of like 12, 13%. So we halved mm -hmm. it. And I think mm -hmm. this is the step we've already taken. And what you then saw over the next five years in, in that domain is that you went from 15 to 3%, but mm -hmm. you didn't need like a fundamental new leap in technology. The technology okay. was already there. It was just that people needed to figure out, okay, this is the right way to do it. I need like one new loss function or one new element of this. And so you basically uh, optimized what you already had. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's if we're at that stage now. So that's why I'm also pretty confident that within one or two years. So we're optimizing and not inventing a new thing. No, um, I think this this invention of the this well, not the really invention, but this application of diffusion models and the big gains that were made there, that was like the, the important step that need to be taken. And now I think uh, that that it's really engineering how to optimally use these models uh, maybe we need some pathology specific adaptations like mm -hmm. uh, we've seen in the past people doing like multi-resolution uh, things instead of uh, one uh, only one doing it at 40x uh, in those directions i think there is still some development but uh, other than that i think it's mainly uh, uh, yeah doing lots of experiments and figuring out like what works best Okay, 
Thank you so much, Gert, for explaining this. Uh, thank you for also diving deeper into the language models and, and the images. And so I will definitely have you again uh, when this uh, AI package starts for big pictures. And then I'm going to come back with this question about image retrieval. Thank sure. you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. You have a fantastic day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. And for Yes, for our people uh, who are on the line, we are having lunch break right now. Uh, so 45 minutes, but be back after lunch. Be back because we have still cool stuff coming up for you. Bye-bye.